Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of A Dangerous Days on the Victorian Railways by Terry Deary. So Terry Deary is the uh, guy who wrote the Horrible Histories books. This is, I guess, more for adults. I mean, it doesn't really specify. I guess it does, so it is a book for adults, which does make sense because... It still kind of is laid out like a Horrible Histories book, but it has like words like fucker and stuff in here, so it doesn't kind of flinch from that. Um, but yeah, I'm going to read you the blurb and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. I will warn you that a lot of my tabs are actually, he puts so many quotes on this, there's pretty much a quote on every page. And so most of my tabs are quotes rather than anything to do with railways, but such is life. Victorian inventors certainly didn't lack steam, but while they squabbled over who deserved the title of the father of the locomotive and enjoyed their fame and fortune, safety on the rails was not their priority. Brakes were seen as a needless luxury and boilers had an inconvenient tendency to overheat and explode and in turn blow up anyone in reach. Often, having, often recognised as having revolutionised travel in industrial Britain, Victorian railways were perilous. Disease, accidents and disasters accounted for thousands of deaths and many more injuries. While history is focused on the triumph of engineers, the victims of the Victorian railways had names, lives and families, and they deserve to be remembered. Okay, so Terry Deary also wrote Dangerous Days in the Roman Empire, as well as Dangerous Days in Elizabethan England, so I'd like to read both of those. Now, as I think I've already said, uh, most of the things I want to highlight in this uh, are actually quotes from people. So there's a quote here from Paul Valéry, French poet and philosopher. He said, power without abuse loses its charm. Charming. Aristotle said, uh, all human actions have one or more of these seven causes. Chance, nature, compulsions, habit, reason, passion, desire. I thought a great quote, another great quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt, the uh, US president. A reactionary is a somnambulist walking backwards. And uh, Deary used that one to kind of support where he's talking about uh, people's negative reactions towards the railway. You know, people saying that it was going to mean that people's brains would fall out of their ears and stuff. So this here is a story about, I think it's about Robert Stevenson. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, Robert's own journey home was hindered by hurricanes. First, his vessel had to stop and help damage ships. On one, the starving crew had resorted to cannibalism. Then a storm carried away most of his luggage and all of his money before he reached New York. As his ship struggled, he was denied a place in a lifeboat. Instead, it went to a third-class passenger. Why? Because that passenger, like the mate in charge, was a Freemason. As soon as he landed, the rueful Robert joined the Freemasons. A funny handshake can save your life. There's a footnote here on the word passé and says the word passé was originally borrowed from the French to describe a woman past the period of greatest beauty. And I thought this was great as well. It says that old wisdom has it that there are five stages in a creative person's career. So one, Dane who? Number two, ah, Dane Cobain. Number three, get me Dane Cobain. Number four, get me a young Dane Cobain. Number five, Dane who? There's a great quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American poet. He said, don't be too timid and squeamish about your actions. All life is an experiment. And obviously a quote that I wanted to share because it's Terry Pratchett. Um, it actually says 1948 question mark, like as though he's still alive, which sadly he is not, but it kind of shows you when this book was published, I guess. Build a man on fire and he'll be warm for a day. Set a man on fire and he'll be warm for the rest of his life. Now there's another footnote here. Um, it says, a Newcastle United football fan who punched a police horse in the head during a riot in April 2013 said in his defence, I love animals. I've got three dogs, a fish pond out the back and I feed foxes across the road. He added, I would like to apologise to the horse. You couldn't make it up. Nice to know he doesn't apparently punch his fish, thank God. Fish suffer enough from being battered. A judge with horse sense jailed him for 12 months. Good, cunt. So we get for punching an animal. And we have a quote by Aldous Huxley here, he said, to us, the moment 8.17 a.m. means something, something very important, if that happens to be the starting time of our daily train. To our ancestors, such an odd eccentric instant was without significance, did not even exist. In inventing the locomotive, Watt and Stevenson were part inventors of time. And uh, so here we have a description of some explosions. So uh, this one it says, uh, as the apprentice looked at the scene of devastation, he found body parts scattered around. These included a set of false teeth and a boot with a foot in it. Boilermaker James Carmichael was blown 70 meters over a canal, trailing entrails until he smashed into a wall. His remains, stuck to the wall, were unrecognizable. A badly manufactured boilerplate was blamed. And uh, here's another one as well. Um, 
So this was at the Sharp, Stewart and Co works in Manchester, 8th of October 1858. One of the dead in the same incident. The luckiest or unluckiest victim has to be Thomas Forsyth. Thomas was hit by the first train to run on the Liverpool to Manchester service in 1829. He had a leg amputated and replaced with a cork one. He lived almost 30 years until he was present when that Russian locomotive blew up the Manchester works where he was manager. He suffered a deep wound to his forehead through which, it was reported, his brain seeped out. A shard of iron had killed him instantly. And uh, we have a quote here from the Hobart Town Daily Mercury, 9th of October 1858. Thomas Forsyth, the well-known and highly skilled manager of the works, was among the killed, his head being much shattered by the force of the explosion and his body much scalded. And just this, I guess, gives you a feel for Terry Deary's sense of humour and his writing style. This one's about Cohen Station in Lancashire, 5th of May 1864. The driver, George Parker, was chatting to his fireman as the steam built in the locomotive boiler. It burst without warning. Parker was thrown against the wheel of a goods wagon. That could have killed him, but it didn't. The blast had already removed his head. It says one piece of boilerplate was thrown over a quarter of a mile. The safety veil, I think it meant valve, it was a typo, which wasn't that safe, fell through a cottage roof and injured old Mary Hartley in bed. It's like Donnie Darko shit. A great little quote here from uh, Spike Milligan, Adolf Hitler, my partner's downfall. I've read that one. We arrived at Bexel on Sea where I got off. It wasn't easy. The train didn't stop there. Somebody says in a letter, I'm sure this will be agreeable to you, and Deary writes, as agreeable to a, as a bacon sandwich to a vegan. Vegan team, assemble. Here's a quote from Kofi Annan, who is uh, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, he said, Literacy is a bridge from misery to hope. It is a tool for daily life in modern society. Literacy is the road to human progress and the means through which every man, woman and child can realise his or her full potential. And we get a uh, Steve Jobs quote here, I think it's quite a famous one of his. Uh, Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things, they push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Thomas Edison, uh, he said, discontent is the first necessity of progress. And uh, there's a quote, uh, I mean, I told you, it was just all quotes all the way through, but Dorothy Parker, if you want to know what God thinks of money, just look at the people he gave it to. There was a Marcus Aurelius quote. He was a Roman emperor, the philosopher king, uh, figure in the Stoic movement, as well as various other philosophical movements. But he said, when men, are hu when men are inhuman, take care not to feel towards them as they do towards other humans. And uh, on the subject of equality, he, uh, he says, even in 1846, a Welsh newspaper was sighing, and this is from the North Wales Chronicle, May 1846. Is there not enough toil, brow, sweat, and heartbreak without turning aside to wound a brother in the spirit of devilry? For nothing less it is. And I think this is something that feels all too familiar, really. Uh, the loss of life was all the more tragic because the Watford Tunnel was unnecessary. It was only built to appease local landowners who were worried the railway would spoil the view from their land if it ran over ground. Ten men died so a landowner could look out on green fields. We have here a story about some corpses being moved from a cemetery. It says, The shifting of corpses from a Manchester cemetery left a terrible stench. When in 1865 it came to skeleton shifting at St Pancras in London, the railway builders were much more careful. The local authority sent along a young man to inspect the grisly work. He was Thomas Hardy, the soon-to-be famous author. He made sure the corpses were reburied discreetly. Far from the madding crowd, I guess. We have a quote from Mahatma Gandhi here, he said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I find that amusing. Yeah, Gandhi also said, po uh, Gandhi also said poverty is the worst form of violence. We have a reference to uh, 1858 Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin publishes The Origin of Species and the footnote says, warning, this Darwin bloke is trying to make monkeys of us all. Let your mirror be your guide. And to me that's worryingly anti evolution. <laughs> I hope Deary doesn't actually think that. There's a Karl Marx quote here, he said, Capital is reckless of the health or length of life of the labourer, unless under compulsion from society. And uh, this guy Wellington Purden, uh, he said, uh, I would not recommend the loss of time for the sake of extra lives it would save. And then people died. Great. Uh, we have Dickens here writing in Little Dorrit, he said credit is a system whereby a person who can't pay gets another person who can't pay to guarantee that he can pay. And a quote from Lana Turner, the American actress, she said a gentleman is simply a patient wolf. 
So I want to read this bit out, including a footnote, because it mentions Tamworth Station, and I'm from Tamworth. It says clocks. Nowadays, there is Greenwich Mean Time for all. But until the 1850s, each town had its own local time. That caused some chaos. In 1814, Inspector had suggested everyone run on London time, but it took some years for the idea to be universally adopted. And just when you thought it was safe to get back on the trains, there was a crash at Tamworth Station. Everyone was on London time, so why did the signalman get his timing wrong and divert the Irish Mail Express through a siding and into the River Tame? Because his watch stopped. And this is kind of insane. It says, Between 1840 and 1850, around 50,000 bridges were built in Britain to accommodate the railways. More bridges than had existed in history till that time. That required an average of 300,000 bricks each. That is a lot. We have here in 1886, shop assistants under 18 are restricted to a maximum of 74 hours a week. Only 74. And we get a, a quote from an American evangelist on the railways here, he says, Railroads are impossibilities and rank infidelity to the Lord. There is nothing in the word of God about them. If God had designed that his intelligent creatures should travel at the frightful speed of 15 miles an hour by steam, he would have clearly foretold it through his holy prophets. It is the device of Satan to lead immortal souls down to hell. Calm down, mate. He points out um, that the lyrics of Day Tripper by the Beatles are weird because it goes, Day Tripper, a one-way ticket, yeah. Whereas most Day Trippers would return. George Bernard Shaw said, a perpetual holiday is a good working definition of hell. Albert Einstein, good old Albo, he said, it should be possible to explain the laws of physics to a barmaid. And then Dickens, he was involved in this train crash. It kind of left, left him affected forever. It says, um, a man pinned under the carriage was one of the ten to die. Ellen was one of the forty injured. Dickens laboured for three hours helping where he could and was lauded as a hero. Then the consummate professional climbed back into the perilously and precariously balanced carriage to recover a manuscript of our mutual friend. He joked that he had recovered two of the characters, Mr and Mrs Boffin, who had been in the carriage with him. After the crash the writer found them much soiled but otherwise unhurt. But the impact on the author's psyche was lasting. He concluded his letter to Milton, but in writing these scanty words of recollection, I feel the shake and am obliged to stop. For the rest of his life, Dickens would try to avoid travel by express trains, and even suffered anxiety when he was travelling by slower, stopping train services. He sometimes got off several stops before his destination and walked the rest of the way. Here we have a little did you know. In the 1840s, a director of the London and Greenwich Railway missed his train. He commandeered a locomotive from the station and set off in pursuit of his train. He was so successful, he not only caught it, but ran into the back of it. The force was so great, it broke the legs of a couple of passengers. More haste, zero speed. And this is crazy. I'm just going to read this story. The Newmarket Arch Crash, 6th of June 1851 and 6th of June 1852. Mr Dickens was not the only victim of the anniversary curse. On the 6th of June 1852, a train was running between Brighton and Lewes when it struck a sleeper that had been laid across the track. A gang of workers were in the area, leaving sleepers alongside the track, but the nearest worker was a few hundred yards away. The train derailed and fell onto the road, killing two crew and three passengers. Sabotage, and the chief suspect was little Jimmy Bokes, who lived in a cottage alongside the track. The police superintendent grilled little Jimmy relentlessly, but the boy denied it. And anyway, how could a ten-year-old lift a three-metre sleeper? An unsolved mystery. On the, 16th, on the 6th of June 1852, one year later to the day, little Jimmy went again to view the scene of the accident. He was struck by a bolt of lightning and killed. The big sleep for the little Jimmy of the big sleeper, maybe. Justice. It did say 1852 for both years in that extract, so that's another mistake there. Quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, First you take a drink, then the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes you. So uh, overall, I did enjoy Dangerous Days on the Victorian Railways. I just, as, as you see, uh, I, I sort of thought that, uh, I don't know, there were too many quotes in it and it didn't necessarily get, uh, I don't know, it was all right. It, it was weird because it was hard to tell who it was aimed at. It read as though it was aimed at both kids and adults at the same time and kind of didn't really hit the mark for either of them as a result of it. And it was also kind of annoying again, there were too, ma too many quotes. I did enjoy the quotes, but there were way too many of them, like one on pretty much every page. I mean, I've just flicked in at random, four on those two pages, three on those two, two on those two. Oh, only one on that one, two on those two. So yeah, loads of quotes throughout this, but overall, probably like a 3.5 out of five, it was all right. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Dangerous Days on the Victorian Railways by Terry Deary. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.